Hello everybody and welcome back to Casual Audio Papers. Today we are continuing in the paper Six Lessons for a Cogent Science of Implicit Bias and Its Criticisms. So let's get right into it. Lesson 3. There is no basis to expect strong unconditional relations between implicit bias and behavior. Discussion. A debated issue in the literature on implicit bias is whether it predicts behavior. Although numerous individual studies have found significant relations between implicit measures and behavioral outcomes, uh, for instance, check out these papers, the average effect sizes obtained in meta-analyses tend to be rather small, with correlations ranging from 0.12 to 0.28. Although some researchers suggested that statistically small relations between implicit bias and behavior could nevertheless have large societal effects, the obtained average correlations are certainly disappointing for researchers who aim to use implicit measures to improve the prediction of behavior at the individual level. And the reason that's significant, of course, is because there are a variety of other um, measures, I suppose, that have a much higher level of correlation between behavior and it predict and these predict behavior a lot more and so if you're really wanting to get at the root of a particular societal issue you implicit bias might not be the first thing that you look at critics have interpreted these findings as evidence for fundamental flaws of imp of implicit measures However, it is important to keep in mind that not a single theory in this area predicts strong zero-order relations between implicit measures and behavioral criteria. Although these theories differ in many important regards, they agree on the broader assumption that predictive relations between attitude measures and behavior depend on the correspondence between the processing conditions of the attitude measurement and the processing conditions of the to-be-predicted behavior. For a detailed discussion, see those guys. Thus, given that implicit measures involve highly constrained processing conditions, implicit measures should be more likely to predict behaviors performed under similar processing conditions. <clears throat> Compared with behaviors performed under dissimilar processing conditions, so um, unintentional behavior resulting from low deliberation would be uh, predicted behaviors performed under similar processing conditions and intentional behaviors resulting from high deliberations would be behaviors performed under dissimilar processing conditions. So from what I'm understanding with this, what they're talking about is um, implicit measures should be more automatic. The implicit measures and the behaviors should be more automatic and more similar in the neural structures that they operate under. So they result from low deliberation, meaning there's um, much less time between the thought and the behavior, and there's much less going on in the brain um, when you when when the implicit bias leads into behavior versus uh, dissimilar processing conditions, which would be, uh, well, the opposite of what I just said. Conversely, given that the processing conditions of explicit measures do not have any such constraints, explicit measures should be more likely to predict behavior performed under unconstrained processing conditions, so intentional behavior resulting from high deliberation compared with behaviors performed under constrained processing conditions, so unintentional behavior resulting from low deliberation. On the basis of this general hypothesis, a substantial number of studies investigated whether predictive relations of implicit and explicit measures to behavior depend on the type of behavior that, that is predicted, 
the conditions under which the to be predicted behavior is performed and characteristics of the person who is performing the to be predicted behavior. The general findings of these studies are that A, implicit measures outperform explicit measures in predicting spontaneous behavior, whereas explicit measures outperform implicit measures in predicting deliberate behavior. So an example would be hiring, for instance. It, implicit behavior has much lower level of input when it comes to hiring somebody because that's a deliberative behavior. And that's as opposed to like clutching your purse when you walk by somebody. That might be a bit, a bit less deliberate, a bit more spontaneous. And that would be predicted more by implicit measures as opposed to explicit. B. Implicit measures outperform explicit measures in predicting behavior performed under conditions that impair cognitive deliberations, I, meaning like getting drunk and stuff like that, whereas explicit measures outperform implicit measures in predicting behavior under conditions that, that, perform, that, that permit cognitive deliberation. And C. Implicit measures outperform explicit measures in predicting behavior by individuals with a disposition linked to low deliberation. So for instance, low working memory capacity or intuitive thinking style. Whereas explicit measures outperform implicit measures in predicting behavior by individuals with a disposition linked to high deliberation. So like when you have high working memory capacity or a deliberate thinking style. Depending on these theoretically derived moderators, behaviors should show stronger predictive relations to either implicit or explicit evaluations. Thus, to the extent that these moderators are ignored and predictive relations are, av on, are averaged across different kinds of behaviors, different experimental conditions and participants with different dispositions, the obtained average correlations should be positive but relatively small overall. As found in every published meta-analysis on the predict prediction of behavior with implicit measures. Not a single meta-analysis has found a non-significant average correlation close to zero or a negative correlation. Moreover, meta-analyses that coded predictive relations obtained within a given study for theoretically derived moderators. For instance, when a given study included measures of both spontaneous and deliberate behavior, found patterns consistent with the assumptions of extant theories in that implicit measures showed stronger relations to behavior under constrained processing conditions compared with behavior under unconstrained processing conditions. However, <clears throat> there is also some evidence that poses a challenge to the moderator hypotheses of extant theories. Contrary to the idea that implicit measures should show stronger relations to spontaneous compared with deliberate behaviors, several meta-analyses that coded the predictive relations obtained in different studies for theoretically derived moderators found no relation between processing conditions and the size of predictive relations. <coughs> And that's actually really interesting because some of the theory has been demonstrated to be at least substantiated while some of the theory has not. So perhaps there's a, uh, a conceptual break or the, the concept of implicit bias may be a bit too broad or something along those lines. In other words, whereas processing conditions within studies did show the hypothesized moderation of predictive relations, processing conditions between studies did not. Hmm. 
There are at least two potential explanations for this paradox. First, it is possible that the assumptions of extant theories are incorrect, and that the obtained moderation within studies is the product of false positives in the individual studies that included direct comparisons of processing conditions. Second, it is possible that the assumptions of extant theories are correct, and that the failure to detect a significant moderation in between study comparisons is due to error uh, variance resulting from procedural differences between studies. In line with the second interpretation, Cameron et al. argued that between study comparisons aggregate across predictor and outcome measures that differ in numerous ways other than the coded variables, which can undermine the detection of actually existing effects. Hmm. One important factor in this regard is the reliability of the behavioral criterion measures. Although extant theories suggest a central role of behavior-related, situation-related, and person-related factors, previous meta-analyses have focused predominantly on behavior-related factors, such as the spontaneous versus deliberate nature of the to-be-predicted behavior, like non-verbal versus verbal behavior. To the extent that the measures of deliberate behavior are more reliable than the measures of spontaneous behavior, the latter of which are often assessed with a single item, predictive relations should be generally stronger for deliberate compared with spontaneous behavior, regardless of the predictor. In this case, implicit and explicit measures should show asymmetric relations to spontaneous versus deliberate behavior that are consistent with the hypotheses of extant theories about explicit measures, but inconsistent with their hypotheses about implicit measures. For explicit measures, the described asymmetry in the reliability of behavioral criteria should produce strong relations to deliberate behaviors because of matching processing conditions with a reliable behavioral criterion and relatively weak or non-significant relations to spontaneous behavior. Because of mismatching processing conditions with an unreliable behavioral criterion. In contrast, for implicit measures, the described asymmetry in the reliability of the behavioral criteria should produce relatively weak relations to both spontaneous behavior because of low reliability of the behavioral measure and deliberate behavior because of mismatching processing conditions. Hmm. Indeed, this asymmetric pattern of predictive relations emerged in, de in every meta-analysis that compared predictive relations of implicit and explicit measures to spontaneous versus deliberate behaviors on a between-study basis. Although some authors interpreted this pattern as evidence against the hypotheses of extant theories, it would be consistent with these theories to the extent that the measures of spontaneous behavior were less reliable than the measures of deliberate behavior. For instance, when spontaneous behavior was measured with a single item and measures of deliberate behavior included multiple items. Another important issue in the evaluation of the weak predictive relations obtained in meta-analyses is that strong relations should be limited to cases in which implicit measures have high conceptual correspondence with the behavioral criterion. See, less, see lesson two. To the extent that conceptual correspondence between the two measures is low, their relation should be weak regardless of the moderators proposed by extant theories. For example, in a study by Omodio and Devine, a measure of implicit evaluative bias was significantly related to participants' desire to befriend a racial outgroup member, but not to their expectations about the outgroup member's performance on a trivia task. Interesting. But see the supplemental materials of Oswald et al. for a potential error in the relations reported for implicit evaluative uh, bias. Hmm. So 
when so implicit bias measures were they predicted more strongly the desire to befriend let's say whatever they're implicitly biased for or against but it didn't really predict very strongly their opinions about whatever the out group would be like intelligence for instance was not really something that was predicted by implicit bias measures Conversely, a measure of implicit stereotypical bias was significantly related to participants' expectations about the odd group members' performance on a trivia task, but not to their desire to befriend the out, out group member. So one was general implicit, uh, implicit evaluative bias versus implicit stereotypical bias. That's actually really interesting. I wonder why implicit evaluative bias was, I, I guess because you're evaluating somebody as a good person or a not good person, more of, an, more of a moral one, while the stereotypical bias is, is sort of determining whether or not they fall under certain stereotypes. And then I guess trivia task, I guess the out group is typically somebody that you think of as less intelligent than you. In line with these findings, a recent meta-analysis by Curity et al. found relatively large relations between IAT measures and intergroup behavior when the two measures had high conceptual correspondence, average correlation of R equals 0.37. However, IAT measures showed no significant relation to intergroup behavior when conceptual correspondence was low, average correlation of R 0 0.02. Makes sense. Together, these considerations suggest that average relations obtained in meta-analyses ignored important complexities in the prediction of behavior with implicit and explicit measures. Strong predictive relations can be expected to emerge only when a high conceptual correspondence exists between the predictor measure and the behavioral criterion and b the processing conditions of the predictor measure match the processing conditions of the to be predicted behavior. So in terms of a the conceptual correspondence is if you have an implicit bias of, let's say, intelligence, then you can expect the explicit behavior to be that which views the other person in, a, in an unintelligent way. So maybe if you're hiring someone and you have an implicit bias about their race's intelligence, like, like thinking that they're less intelligent or something, and the job that you're hiring them into is a is an intelligent based job then perhaps that could affect it more strongly than if you think that a certain race has big feet like something just unrelated but it also another thing that matters is whether or not the implicit bias manifests when you're in a non-deliberative or a deliber deliberative state in which case for it to affect hiring the implicit bias would have to manifest in, an, in a deliberative state and it would have to correspond to what the specific bias is <clears throat> Thus, when predictive relations are averaged in a single meta-analytic effect size, implicit measures should show significant positive but relatively weak relations to behavior, as found in every meta-analysis on the prediction of behavior with implicit measures. Of course, there is no guarantee that the hypotheses of extant theories are correct, and that future studies and meta-analytic reviews will support the predictions derived from these theories, 
However, a focus on unconditional zero order relations in the prediction of behavior can be criticized for ignoring the current state of theory and research on attitude behavior relations. On the one hand, attempts to show large unconditional relations between implicit measures and behavior seem unlikely to succeed given the lack of a theoretical and methodological basis for large unconditional relations. On the other hand, criticism of implicit measures for showing relatively weak average relations to behavior seems premature given that predictive relations can be expected to be relatively weak when theoretical and methodological moderators are ignored. <clears throat> Implications Lesson 3 suggests that there is no reason to expect strong unconditional relations between implicit bias and behavior. Thus, research on the prediction of behavior would benefit from focusing on moderators of predictive relations rather than zero-order correlations between implicit bias and behavior. Although extant theories differ in many important regards, they agree on the general assumption that predictive relations between attitudes and behavior should depend on the correspondence between the processing conditions of the attitude measurement and the processing conditions of the to-be-predicted behavior. On the basis of this assumption, predictive, predictive relations of implicit and explicit measures to behavior should depend on the type of behavior that is predicted, the conditions under which the to-be-predicted behavior is performed, and characteristics of the person who is performing the to-be-predicted behavior. Although the findings of several individual studies support these assumptions, for uh, future research, may be more successful in convincing skeptics by following recently established best practices to avoid false positives, like sufficiently large sample sizes, pre-registration, independent replication. Because differences in the reliability of measurement instruments can distort the patterns of dissociations obtained with implicit and explicit measures, an important issue in this endeavor is to ensure comparable reliabilities of the predictor measures that are used as well as the measures of the to-be-predicted outcomes. Finally, because low conceptual correspondence should lead to low predictive relations, regardless of the moderators proposed by extant theories, the contents of the predictor measures should correspond to the contents of the to-be-predicted behaviors. Of course, there is no guarantee. There is no guarantee that such studies will support the predictions derived from extant theories. However, research focusing on exclusively on unqualified zero-order correlations could be criticized for making a rather small scientific contribution because it ignores the current state of the field. <coughs> So one of the uh, things about this section, this lesson, is that it is demonstrating that there are, there is actually good substantiation for some implicit bias uh, claims, like for instance that perhaps it actually exists. But the issue I think that we see is lesson three compared to lesson one. Lesson one demonstrates that in terms of the definition of implicit bias that needs to be redefined but it but lesson three shows us that implicit bias do, uh, does actually exist whatever it means whatever the definition of implicit bias is and so if people just say it doesn't exist then they're not following the data it seems so far. But there's also apparently not enough data yet in order to uh, establish it within the scientific field. Okay. Lesson four. Implicit bias is less, not more stable over time than explicit bias. Discussion. <clears throat> 
Although lesson three suggests that implicit measures might be valuable tools for predicting behavior if the identified moderators, moderators are taken into account, a more fundamental issue can undermine the, ut the utility of implicit measures in predicting future behavior. In contrast to the widespread assumption that the constructs captured by implicit measures are highly stable, findings of several longitudinal studies suggest that implicit measures tend to show lower test-retest correlations compared with explicit measures, even when the two kinds of measures show comparable estimates of internal consistency. <clears throat> For example, across two longitudinal studies that compared the temporal stability of explicit and implicit measures over a period of one to two months in three content do domains, racial attitudes, political attitudes, and self-concept, Garonsky et al. found a weighted average stability of R equals 0.54 for implicit measures and weighted average of stability of R.75 for explicit measures. These results suggest that a person's score on an implicit measure today provides limited information about this person's score on the same measure at a later time. Needless to say, such temporal fluctuations can be detrimental if the goal is to predict future behavior from the scores of an implicit measure obtained at an earlier time. Explicit measures fare better in this regard in that they show a significantly higher stability over time compared with implicit measures. From this perspective, explicit measures can be expected to be superior predictors of future behavior, regardless of the moderators hypothesized um, by extant theories, simply because explicit measures tend to show less temporal fluctuations than implicit measures. Although the low temporal stability of implicit measures can undermine their usefulness in predicting future behavior, this limitation does not necessarily question their construct validity, as suggested by some crit critics of implicit measures. From a psychometric view, low temporal stability simply suggests a low proportion of stable trait variance. Yet, in contrast to widespread in interpretations of implicit measures as pure indicators, of, temp of temporally stable traits, a considerable proportion of temporally fluctuating variants may reflect momentary states. The latter conclusion is consistent with studies that use latent state trait analysis to decompose the, the contributions of situation-related and person-related factors in, in implicit measures. What that basically means is an explicit measure will, might show you what you actually believe. An implicit measure might just be due to the fact that you have a black boss that you don't like, or you have recently had a run-in with a white person or something like that. And it's much less stable in terms of like how you actually re react implicitly. Consistent with the findings of these studies, some theories suggest that implicit measures reflect the momentary activation of associations in memory, which depends on situational factors over and above a person's chronic structure of associations in memory. That's actually why the, uh, what's it called, the condition stimuli study, or not study, um, test that I took a couple days ago um, is actually really, what, what would you call it? It's really interesting because according to this research, it seems like that should predict or sh that should change implicit biases a lot more than, hmm, maybe I, I'm not really not, not a lot more than something. It should change implicit biases similarly to when you have a positive or negative interaction with uh, some entity that you might be implicitly biased towards. <clears throat> 
Some theories suggest that implicit measures reflect the momentary activation of associations in memory, which depends on situational factors over and above a person's chronic structure of associations in memory. So it's probably, according to these, these um, studies, it's probably more a factor of working memory than it is of long-term memory. Or at the very least, the structures that lead to these um, implicit associations are much weaker and much more variable and prone to variation and prone to change than um, other sorts of associations in the memory. Thus, although temporal fluctuations in the momentary activation of associations can be detrimental for predicting future behavior via implicit measures, this limitation does not necessarily question the construct of validity of implicit measures as indicators of a person's thoughts at the time of measurement. Indeed, it would seem premature to dismiss a measure that is supposed to capture what is on a person's mind in a given moment simply because the measures show different results over time. After all, a person's thoughts in a given moment are determined not only by personal factors, but also by situational ones. So it's a classic example. I tell you, don't think of an elephant, and you think of an elephant and you take an implicit association test and the implication is that you are racist or you are not racist and so now you have to prove that you're not racist or whatever it is that you're trying to prove so therefore there's a sort of a, a potential of false positives for implicit bias tests because of this um, because of what this paragraph just said it's possible that it's a product of what you're thinking at the time sort of like lie detector tests nevertheless the fact that implicit measures show relatively low stability over time conflicts with a common narrative in the literature according to which a, a person's score on an implicit measure reflects a trait-like characteristic of that person, meaning a lot of people assume that it's like a personality trait, but that's a misconception. And B, these traits are acquired early in childhood and remain stable over the course of development. Although the obtained test-retest correlations are consistent with the idea that implicit measures are at least partly influenced by trait-like characteristics, the overall size of these correlations suggest that situation-related factors have a considerable impact on implicit measures over and above trait-related trait factors. So like if, let's say, you are more conscientious and you have a sort of disgust response towards homosexuality and so you have it, you have a higher likelihood of having an implicit bias against homosexuality the situational the situation that you are in has a greater likelihood of influencing your implicit bias for or against homosexuals um, than does your personality trait Moreover, given that a person's score on the same implicit measures fluctuate considerably over a few weeks, claims that these scores reflect trait-like characteristics required, acquired during childhood seem difficult to reconcile with the available evidence. The low temporal stability of implicit measures also raises the question of why children as young as six years old show levels of implicit biases that are indistinguishable from the ones shown by adults. Payne, Vuletic, and Lundberg argued that this paradox could be resolved by assuming that a. implicit biases reflect currently accessible concepts, and b. concept accessibility is primarily determined by environmental factors. Thus, to the extent that adults and children are exposed to the same environmental factors, 
they should show similar average levels of implicit bias, as found in several developmental studies. This explanation reconciles the low temporal stability of implicit measures with the finding that children and, and adults show similar average levels of implicit bias. Low temporal stability at the individual level is explained by the strong impact of transient situational factors at the individual level and comparable average levels of implicit bias among children and adults are explained by the fact that children and adults tend to live in the same cultural environments. However, the strong emphasis on situational factors in this explanation implies the possibility that even the temporally stable component of implicit biases is the product of situational factors. To the extent that people's cultural environments are at least somewhat stable and consistent over time, the obtained level of stable variance in implicit measures may reflect the relatively stable stability of people's environments rather than trait-like characteristics of individuals. So it's more a nurture thing than a nature thing. Although radically situationist interpretations of implicit bias seem difficult to reconcile with evidence for mutual interactions between person-related and situation-related factors, see Lesson 5, the possibility that temporally stable variants may reflect stable environments poses an even greater challenge to the idea that implicit bias scores provide diagnostic information about traits. I think that's pretty much, in the literature that I've read on this topic, that's pretty much correct. It all seems to be highly situational. And even in the book Biased by, I, I never went and checked out the person's name, a woman. Um, that seemed to be the indication that um, these biased behaviors and these implicit biases um, are highly situational dependent. And as, if you are to really remove implicit biases, let's say against black people or against white people, then what you want to do is get people to, um, well, live together as much as they can. So uh, integration is a really important factor for removing implicit bias and, well, bias in general, which is why I think that it's a better scientifically based strategy for removing racism than uh, multiculturalism would be. Implications. A common narrative in research on implicit bias suggests that a a person's score on an implicit measure reflects a trait-like characteristic of that person and b these traits are acquired early in childhood and remain stable over the course of development. These assumptions are difficult to reconcile with a substantial body of evidence showing that implicit biases tend to fluctuate considerably over time and in fact are less stable over time compared with explicit biases. Although these findings do not necessarily question the, con the construct of validity of implicit measures, they suggest an interpretation of implicit biases that is fundamentally different from the mainstream narrative. Different from dominant interpretations of implicit biases as reflecting temporally stable characteristics of a person, the available evidence suggests that implicit measures capture both traits and states. This conclusion is relevant not only for conceptual interpretations of implicit biases, but also for research on the prediction of behavior and the antecedents, uh, antecedents of implicit uh, biases. On the one hand, the low temporal stability of implicit biases poses a major challenge for predicting behavior over time. On the other hand, the contribution of transient states suggests that intervention-related changes in implicit bias may reflect short-lived changes in the state of a given individual rather than temporally stable changes in that person's traits. Let's see. Wow, I went through two of those in 39 minutes. Looks like I still have time, so let's do lesson five.
I was really only expecting to do two of them. Because like last time I did two lessons and it took an hour. But we are not there yet. So let's keep going. Give me one second while I drink some water. Lesson 5. Context matters fundamentally for the outcomes obtained with implicit bias measures. Discussion. The conclusions of Lesson 4 imply that contextual factors are essential for understanding the outcomes obtained with implicit measures. In fact, the available evidence suggests that contextual factors determine virtually every finding with implicit measures, including A, their overall scores, B, their temporal stability, C, the prediction of future behavior, and D, the effectiveness of interventions. Although the significance of contextual factors has been identified in the early years of research in, in implicit measures, contextual thinking has still not penetrated the mainstream narrative about implicit bias. I, that's the reason for that is because implicit bias sort of has a, it's kind of a bad framing of what the phenomenon is because implicit bias sort of paints the picture or has a connotation of something that is within you and not something that is um, put within you by the environment. And so it, it sort of has the popular connotation of, of like some sort of low level radiation that just sort of gives you a tiny dose of radiation over time that will eventually uh, cause significant damage but at any given time it's just it's such a low level of things and not very uh, prominent but according to the literature that's not the case it's more like you work near a uh, a uh, nuclear power plant that doesn't know how to contain the radiation properly that's a bit more what it is With regard to the overall scores obtained with implicit measures, a substantial body of research has demonstrated that implicit measures are highly sensitive to a broad range of contextual factors. Examples of contextual factors that have been shown to influence implicit bias include recently encountered exemplars of a given category, the environment in which a, a given target person is encountered, contextually salient categories, the social role of a perceiver, hmm. and incidental emotional states of the perceiver. The social role of the perceiver is actually really interesting because I haven't thought about that one. But basically, if you perceive yourself to be in a more dominant role, then maybe you'll uh, see the out group as less dominant or meant to be dominated or something along those lines. But if you see yourself in a dominated role, then maybe you see you demonize the out group or maybe you look up to them or something along those lines. That's actually really interesting. I haven't thought about that yet. On the basis of a review of these findings, Garonsky and Bodenhausen argued that exposure to a given stimulus does not activate all components of the stored representation of that stimulus. Hmm. Instead, activation is limited to a subset of stored information, and contextual cues influence which aspects of the representation are activated in response to a given stimulus. That makes sense. Like, if you see a bear in the wild, and it's near you, the, uh, the, 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 the context and the activated information does not bring, a, bring out the idea of a teddy bear. You don't want to go hug it. You are terrified of it. And likewise, the inverse is true. If you see a teddy bear, you're not terrified of it. You, are, uh, you want to cuddle with it or, or something along those lines. And so it's the same with implicit bias. 
it seems, is what they're saying. <laughs> With regard to context effects on the temporal uh, stability of implicit bias, there is evidence that implicit measures show greater uh, test-retest correlations to the extent to the extent that a meaningful context cues constrain the activation of stored information, and b these context cues are consistent over time. In a largely neglected study on this issue, uh, Geschwender, Hoffman, and Schmidt found rather low levels of stability in implicit bias over a period of two weeks when they used a standard variant of the IAT, R equals 0.29. However, temporal stability of implicit bias over the same period was significantly higher when the measure included background images to provide meaningful information about the context of the target stimuli. That made it R equals 0.72, which, if you remember in the uh, last lesson, was the same uh, level of an explicit bias, which was R equals 0.75, so almost the same. These findings suggest that a person's level of implicit bias fluctuates over time in the absence of strong contextual constraints. However, implicit bias seems to be quite stable over time to the extent that contextual constraints are strong and consistent across measurements. And what that means is you're not going to react to a black person in, in uh, the ghetto the same way you'd react to a black person in a suit in the office or something along those lines. There may be a little um, overlap there, but in the vast majority of instances, you're going to react to the black person in the office the same way that you'll react to any other black person in the office. Whereas that's not the same as how you react to a black person in the ghetto. And so that seems to be what that's saying. In addition to demonstrating the impact of contextual factors on the temporal stability of implicit measures, the findings of Geschwender et al. also have important implications for the prediction of future behavior with implicit measures. Because implicit measures tend to show considerable fluctuation over time in the absence of strong contextual constraints, it seems unrealistic to expect strong relations between previously administered implicit measures and future behavior under such conditions. After all, it seems unlikely that a measure would predict future behavior if the scores on the measure today are weakly related to the scores on the same measure at a, at a later time. Yet predictive relations to future behavior may be higher to the, ex, uh, to the extent that scores on the predictor measure are stable over time. Thus, given that implicit measures show considerable levels of temporal stability when contextual constraints are strong and consistent across measurements, the latter conditions may also increase their predictive relations to future behavior. Hmm. That makes sense. A final issue concerning the role of contextual factors in understanding the effectiveness of interventions to change implicit bias. Oh, wait, let me reread re that. A final issue concerns the role of contextual factors in understanding the effectiveness of interventions to change implicit bias. A central question in the literature on bias intervention is whether the effects of a given intervention remain stable over time. In a large-scale study that compared the effectiveness of 17 interventions to reduce implicit bias, Lay et al. found considerable differences in the immediate effects of the tested interventions, in that some interventions effectively reduced implicit bias, whereas others did not. However, a follow-up study comparing the nine most effective interventions revealed that none produced stable reductions over time. Although every intervention reduced implicit bias immediately after the intervention, implicit bias went back to pre-intervention baselines for all nine interventions. I don't know how that connects with the idea that it's highly variable, because you, you, you would expect that, wouldn't you, with an intervention on a highly variable trait? That is interesting, though, 
also because in the in the in what I've read in the literature, um, there was one intervention that did have some level of stability over time, and that was what was it? Basically, if you take somebody and let's say they have an implicit bias, you reveal to them that implicit bias. The effective way of reducing that implicit bias is to is for them to desire and make their own steps towards alleviating that bias um, to educate themselves. The um, the way that it's often done, like when you do those diversity training seminars or whatever, is like the least effective way to do it because, you know, nobody actually knows why they're there and you telling them why they're there is not really going to help. They have to basically discover it on their own and have a predisposition to want to remove implicit bias. If they don't have a predisposition, a predisposition to remove implicit bias, then the likelihood that any intervention is going to work is like nil. It's just not going to happen. And that's a large segment of the population. And so there are serious questions about whether interventions are really appropriate in the first place. At least that's my question. And I think you, you have to demonstrate that the implicit bias has actually led to the behavior that um, people are assuming that they have led to, as, a, as opposed to explicit bias. And what this study is showing is they're actually, it has not really led to the behavior in the same way that people have um, um, sort of decided that it has. And so should we attempt to alleviate implicit bias? Well, that's an ethics question. <clears throat> One potential interpretation of this finding is that the tested interventions merely influenced the subset of stored information that was activated in response to a given stimulus similar to the reviewed effects of contextual factors. In this case, the obtained effects on implicit bias would reflect fleeting changes in the momentary activation of stored information, rather than changes in the stored representation itself. Hmm. Yet an, alter yet an alternative interpretation is that the tested interventions act effectively changed the stored representation, but these changes were limited to the context in which the intervention occurred. Research inspired by the notion of contextual uh, renewal in animal learning suggests that the effects of, of uh, counter-attitudinal information are sometimes limited to the context in which the counter-attitudinal information was learned. The typical pattern obtained in this research is that counter-attitudinal information determines uh, evaluative responses in the context in which the counterattitudinal information was learned. Whereas initial attitudinal information continues to influence responses in any other context, including the context in which the initial attitudinal information was learned or, or novel contexts in which the target object uh, has not been encountered before. It's actually really important because um, people are like the the primary response to novel experience is a little bit of fear and negative emotion, which people who are more open tend to then immediately or almost immediately shift to positive emotion if it's determined quickly that the novel experience or information is not a threat. And so that would just be if you have an implicit bias towards something in novel contexts that's basically just normal healthy human behavior 
Because participants from Lay et al. completed the study online and there was no control over the context in which participants completed the two sessions, it is possible that participants completed the delayed follow-up measurement in a context that was different from the context of the intervention and the immediate assessment of implicit bias. In this case, the reduced effectiveness of the nine interventions in influencing implicit bias at the follow-up measurement may have been due to a change in context rather than to low stability of changes over time. That is, a given intervention may be effective in producing long-term changes in implicit bias within the context in which the intervention occurred, but the effects of the intervention may be limited in the sense that they do not generalize across contexts. Conversely, even if a given intervention effectively reduces implicit bias within the same context over time, the effectiveness of the intervention could be limited in the sense that the observed reduction is limited to the context in which the intervention occurred. Thus, to establish the effectiveness of a given intervention, it is important to, to include not only delayed follow-up measurements, but also measurements in contexts that are different from the one in which the intervention took place. At a broader level, a central implication of the reviewed findings is that implicit biases might be better understood in terms of complex person-by-situation interactions rather than exclusive effects of a person-related or situation-related factor. A person may show different responses to the same stimulus depending on the context in which the stimulus is encountered. Conversely, different people may show different responses to a given stimulus within the same context. And these context-specific individual differences may be, may be relatively stable over time. Theoretically, these patterns can be explained as the interactive products of A, the pre-existing structure of associations in memory, person-related factor, and B, the overall configuration of input stimuli, situation-related factor. The two factors constrain each other in the sense that the pre-existing structure of associations in memory cons constrains the contents that are activated in response to a given stimulus and context stimuli constrain which, pre which pre-existing associations are activated in response to a target stimulus. Implications. Lesson 5 suggests that context matters fundamentally for the outcomes obtained with implicit measures, including A, their overall scores, B, their temporal stability, C, the prediction of future behavior, and, and D, the effectiveness of interventions. Related to the notion that implicit biases reflect both traits and states, Contextual factors have been found to influence overall levels of implicit bias. Moreover, strong contextual constraints have been found to increase the temporal stability of implicit biases, suggesting a major role for person-by-situation interactions. Further, the higher stability of implicit biases under conditions of strong contextual constraints suggests that strong relations between implicit bias and future behavior require consistent contextual constraints over time. Finally, the notion of contextual renewal suggests that even if intervention-based changes are temporally stable within the context in which the intervention occurred, the observed changes may not generalize to other contexts. Future research on implicit bias would benefit from greater attention to the multiple ways by which contextual factors can influence the outcomes obtained with implicit measures. This is more evidence for the uh, integration uh, intervention as opposed to the multicultural intervention. Let's see, what do I have left here? Hmm. 
Let's finish this up. Lesson six, In implicit measures do not provide process pure reflections of bias. Discussion. A final lesson is that implicit measures do not provide process pure reflection of a focal construct, for instance, racial bias. Like any psychological measure, variance in the scores obtained with implicit measures, X, comp uh, comprises variance reflecting the construct of interest, C. Hmm. S systematic error. ES and random error, ER, which can be depicted in the equation X equals C plus ES plus ER, which makes sense. Somewhat surprisingly, this widely accepted insight is rarely considered in research on implicit bias, which can lead to inaccurate conclusions about its psychological properties. One important issue in this regard is that implicit measures based on respo uh, response interference are strongly influenced by executive control processes over and, over and above the impact of dominant response tendencies reflecting bias. For example, in an IAT designed to measure racial bias, negativity towards African Americans may elicit a, a prepotent tendency to press the negative key in response to black faces. This tendency should facilitate quick and accurate responses when the response key for, um, neg for negative stimuli is the same as the one for black faces. In contrast, quick and accurate responses should be inhibited when the response key for negative stimuli is different from the one for black faces. It's just explaining what an IAT is, the implicit association test. Note that the speed and accuracy of responses in the latter block is influenced not only by the strength of the prepotent tendency to press the negative key, presumably reflecting the degree of negativity toward African Americans, but also by executive control processes. Given that participants have to suppress their po uh, prepotent response tendency to provide the correct response, because executive control varies across individuals and contextual factors, variance in IAT scores comprises not only variance in the construct of interest, meaning, for instance, racial bias, but also variance reflecting systematic error, executive control. Um, basically meaning if, if you have a bias against black people or black faces, then it takes a lot more executive control and, and a lot more work to, to associate a black face with a positive word like beautiful or good or something along those lines, which theoretically means that you sh it, if you have a bias one way or the other, then you should be able or, or you should take slightly longer, not all that longer, but slightly longer when you are associating a black face with good words, as opposed to when you associate a black face with bad words, like ugly or bad or evil. That's the theory, and that's what they just explained. This insight has important implica implications for both experimental and correlational research using implicit measures. For example, to the extent that an experimental manipulation influences measurement scores on an IAT designed to measure racial bias, the obtained effect may reflect either a difference in racial bias or a difference in executive control, or both. Meaning there, maybe you just are not as good at switching from black equals good to black equals bad, or vice versa. Moreover, the extent that given manipulation influences racial bias and executive control in ways that compensate each other, meaning higher levels of racial bias compensated by higher levels of executive control, the experimental manipulation may show a null effect on traditional IAT scores. Similar concerns apply to research using correlational designs. For example, if measurement scores on an IAT designed to measure racial bias 
shows a significant correlation with a criterion measure, meaning, for instance, behavior. This correlation could be driven by either shared variance in the, con in the construct of interest, racial bias, shared variance in systematic error, executive control, or both. One potential way to resolve these ambiguities is the use of formal modeling procedures to analyze the data obtained with an implicit measure. One example is the quad model for Con uh, from Conry et al., which allows researchers to, qualify, to quantify the contributions of four qualitatively distinct processes to IAT performance, activation of an association, detection of the correct response required by the task, success at overcoming associated bias, and guessing. An alternative strategy is to replicate a given finding that implicit measures that have distinct sources of systematic error, as can be ex expected for implicit measures that are based on different underlying processes. For example, in contrast to, to the respond to the response interference mechanism underlying the IAT and evaluative priming, the AMP is based on a misattribution mechanism that involves sources of systematic error that are distinct from the ones affecting sort uh, so, uh, that are distinct from the one affecting scores on the IAT and evaluative priming. Thus, successful replications with two types of implicit measures provide a stronger basis for conclusions that a given effect is driven by the construct of interest rather than sources of systematic error. The significance of task-specific mechanisms can be illustrated with findings sh showing that the same experimental manipulation can have distinct effects on implicit measures with different underlying mechanisms. For example, in a series of studies by Goronsky, Cunningham et al., participants completed an EPT using black and white faces of either young or old age as primes. Half of the participants were instructed to count the number of black and white faces presented in the task. The remaining half were asked to count the number of young and old faces. Goronsky, uh, Cunningham et al., found reliable priming effects of implicit race bias when participants paid attention to race, but not when they paid attention to age. Conversely, reliable priming effects of implicit age bias merged only when participants paid attention to age, but not when they paid attention to race. This pattern was reflected in the overall size of priming effects, their internal consistency and their relation to corresponding measures of, of explicit bias. In line with extant theories, uh, Fazio, Garonsky, and Bodenhausen, this finding may be interpreted as evidence for the hypothesis that evaluative responses to a given stimulus depend on how perceivers categorize that stimulus, like uh, categorization of a young black man in terms of race versus age. However, in contrast to this interpretation, the same manipulation has no significant effect on priming effects in the AMP. That is, participants who completed the AMP showed reliable priming effects of implicit race bias, regardless of whether they paid attention to race or age. Likewise, participants who completed the AMP showed reliable priming effects of implicit age bias, regardless of whether they paid attention to age or race. On the basis of earlier comparisons of priming effects in the EPT and AMP, uh, Garonsky, Cunningham et al. argued that the obtained effects on the EPT reflect attentional influences on the response interference mechanism underlying the EPT rather than genuine effects on implicit bias. Hmm. Specifically, the authors argued that the response interference mechanism underlying the EPT presupposes attention to the relevant features of the primes. So like when I was um, doing the test a couple days ago and I was focused a lot more on the, the, quali the qualities that I wanted to focus on as opposed to what they were testing, which was whether or not 
names had Western or non-Western names um, features. Specifically, the authors argued that the response interference mechanism underlying the EPT presupposes attention to the relevant features of the primes, which is not the case for the misattribution mechanism underlying the AMP. Thus, in studies that exclusively rely on implicit measures based on response interference, manipulations that influence participants' attention to different features of a stimulus can lead to the, to the incorrect conclusion that these manipulations influenced implicit bias. Although the obtained differences may simply reflect effects on the response interference mechanism underlying the task. The broader significance of these issues can be illustri um, illustrated with a widely cited finding of an unpublished meta-analysis of change in implicit bias. Forscher et al. found that most procedures designed to change implicit bias were effective, although average effect sizes were rather small for many of the tested interventions. Moreover, most procedures had larger effects on implicit bias compared with behavioral measures, and there was no evidence that change in implicit bias mediated change in behavior. On the basis of these findings, the authors concluded that changes in implicit bias do not lead to changes in behavior which poses a challenge to the idea that implicit bias causes discriminatory behavior. If implicit bias were a cause of discriminatory behavior, experimentally induced changes in implicit bias should lead to corresponding changes in discriminatory behavior, which was not the case in the meta-analysis by Forscher et al. Although the findings from Forscher et al. have become a central argument in the criticism of research on implicit bias, the criticism is based on a number of background assumptions that seem questionable in light of the issues reviewed in the current article. First, change in implicit bias should lead to corresponding change in behavior only under specific conditions, see Lesson 3. Because the meta-analysis from Forscher et al. did not fully account for these conditions, it is possible that discrepant effects on implicit bias and behavior are at least partly due to a mismatch of processing conditions and a lack of conceptual correspondence between measures. Second, the methodological dictum that scores obtained with implicit measures, like any other psychological measure, reflects systematic construct variance as well as uh, systematic error variance, implies the possibility that some procedures may influence measurement scores via effects on sources of systematic error, like executive control, rather than the constructs of interest, like racial bias. For example, procedures that tax participants' cognitive research, uh, resources were found to be among the first effective pr uh, procedures to influence implicit bias. However, such procedures seem more likely to influence measurement scores via reduced executive control rather than genuine changes in bias. In this case, it seems rather unlikely that the obtained effect on measurement scores would be associated with corresponding effects on a behavioral criterion measure unless resources are also taxed for the behavioral measure. Implications Lesson 6 suggests that research on implicit bias would benefit from explicitly considering the methodological dictum that variance in the scores obtained with implicit measures, like any other measure, reflects a. systematic con construct variance, b. systematic measurement error, and c. random error. This, truis this truism implies that any effect obtained with implicit measures may be driven by the construct of interest, or by measurement-related processes that are independent of the to-be-measured construct. Thus, treatments of implicit measurement scores as process peer reflections of the to-be-measured construct can lead to incorrect conclusions about the psychological properties of implicit bias. Future research on implicit bias would benefit from directly addressing these ambiguities by analyzing data with formal modeling procedures that disentangle the contributions of multiple distinct pro processes to measurement outcomes or comparing findings across implicit measures that are based on different underlying mechanisms or both.
Conclusion Table 1 provides an overview of the normative implications of the six lessons reviewed in this article. Table 1 Lesson 1 Awareness Specify which aspect of implicit bias is assumed to be outside of awareness, meaning source, content, or impact. Specify whether unawareness of this aspect is assumed to be unique to implicit bias, as opposed to explicit bias. Provide empirical evidence for any hypotheses about unawareness. If no evidence can be provided, refrain from making claims about unawareness or explicitly describe them as speculative. Lesson 2. Conceptual Correspondence Avoid confounds between type of measure, implicit versus explicit, and different contents, uh, like exemplars versus categories. If there is no conceptual correspondence, discuss alternative interpretations of dissociations in terms of different contents. Lesson 3. Relations to Behavior Ensure conceptual correspondence between predictor measures and behavioral criteria. Test moderators of predictive relations, including type of behavior, conditions of behavior, and individual differences. Ensure com comparable reliabilities for different predictor measures, as well as behavioral criteria. Lesson 4. Temporal Stability Consider that low temporal stability of implicit bias can be detrimental to predicting behavior over time. Consider that changes in implicit bias scores may reflect either stable changes in traits or transient changes in states. Lesson 5. Context Effects Aim for consistency in measurement contexts in studies on prediction of behavior over time. To investigate effectiveness of bias interventions, include follow-up measurements and measurements in different contexts. Lesson 6. Lack of process purity. Analyze data with formal modeling procedures to disentangle contributions of multiple distinct processes, and replicate findings with implicit measures that are based on different underlying mechanisms. Although the current analysis focuses uh, focused primarily on implicit bias, it is worth noting that the key points are relevant for all research using implicit measures. Moreover, many of the key points apply not only to implicit bias, but also to explicit bias. The dominant focus on implicit bias was inspired by the increasing skepticism about the value of the construct in understanding social discrimination and the rather low appreciation of the six lessons in research on implicit bias compared with other areas. Together, the six lessons suggest that research on implicit bias would benefit from considering the broader literature on implicit measures, as well as historical debates on research on attitudes. In the same, at the same time, dismissing the implicit bias construct as entirely irrelevant for the psychological understanding of social discrimination seems premature in light of the six lessons. Of course, previous research on implicit bias can be criticized for providing ambiguous evidence that does not permit strong conclusions of either kind. However, by following the normative implications of the six lessons, future research may directly address these ambiguities and, there, and thereby provide a more nuanced understanding of implicit bias, its psychological characteristics, and its contribution to social discrimination. Whether this research will ultimately confirm a unique role of implicit bias over and above explicit bias is an open question, and there is no guarantee that the obtained findings will suggest an affirmative answer. However, to provide a strong basis for empirically convincing conclusions of either kind, it is essential to directly address the limitations of previous research. The normative implications of the six lessons may provide a helpful framework in this endeavor, providing the foundation for a cogent science of implicit bias. It's a really good paper. I think. Uh, one thing that I learned going through it again is that, of course, when people measure implicit bias, it's really important to understand that 
they're measuring something. It may not be entirely, like the concept of implicit bias may not be entirely fleshed out, but something's there and we're not entirely sure what it is. And the other thing that I learned is it's not stable over time. It's something I forgot from last time I read this paper, but the results of implicit bias seem to be more contextually based than they are um, trait based or innately based. And that's something that's really important for us to understand, which is why integration is a really important thing to help alleviate implicit bias. If people are actually serious about alleviating implicit bias, then uh, multiculturalism and creating little pockets of different cultures in different parts of the city or whatever is the last thing you want to do. Integration is what you want to do to alleviate discrimination in a variety of ways. So I hope you uh, enjoyed that. I finished that a lot quicker than I thought I was going to. So uh, yeah, if you have any questions or comments or concerns, let me know in the comments. Have a good day.